I'm a consultant with uh, OT Consulting Nigeria and Arus uh, Education. Uh, our operations are based in Malaysia and Nigeria, but we uh, process admission to universities all around the world. So no matter where you want to go, we have uh, answers to that for you. So I'll be speaking about studying in Russia. Let me share my screen. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, in the first part, I'm going to speak about Russia, why you study in Russia, the peculiarities of uh, being an international student in Russia, the application process for us, uh, if you're working with us then, uh, about tuition and living expenses, and then uh, visa processing. I'm going to speak uh, briefly about those. And then in the second part, I'm going to actually address a few uh, frequently asked questions so that we can reduce the time we're going to be spending in the question and answer session. Uh, because I believe a number of your questions will be addressed there. I'll talk about uh, processing charges, uh, scholarships, and then the scholarship test, as well as uh, the 2022 entry scholarship that is currently on. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the map of Russia, as you can see there, you can Actually, see the location and the size is a very huge nation that spans across both Asia and Europe. So we'll talk more about Russia as we go on. So the population of 2020 is about 144 million people, as you can see there, and it occupies about 10% of all the land on earth. That makes Russia the largest country by land mass almost twice the size of Canada, with 11 time zones, and of course, crossing two continents. Lowest temperature recorded in 2020 was minus 58.3 degrees Celsius in Delianke. I don't know how that's pronounced, but that's not something to worry too much about, I believe, because uh, in Moscow, it was just about minus 10. So you, probably find something like that elsewhere in the world. So it's nothing to worry about, I guess. So Russia shares uh, land borders with about 16 countries and sea borders with Japan and the USA. So that's, I mean, I, I, I think of Russia as the land of opportunities. It's like you are at the center of the entire world and you are just in touch with practically everywhere. Uh, Russia is number two in the world for defense technology. Moscow, which is uh, Russia's capital city, is one of the richest cities in the world. And it is known to have more billionaires than any other city anywhere in the world. I think those are things uh, that are nice to know. So Russia is a nice country, a wonderful country with uh, good uh, heritage and nice uh, ancient history. And then about education in Russia briefly, of course the tuition is low, although I would say that's relative depending on where you study, but if you are looking for a place to study where the tuition is affordable, you can easily find in Russia. Uh, you can study and work, and that's one of the things that I think uh, most students always prefer. And then you can find full and partial scholarships. Russia has a unique uh, education system from our experience, uh, no processing admission for students or in different countries around the world, in the sense that in most countries, you can only get scholarships when you are like best student, first class, you know, top student. They are the only ones who have access to scholarship opportunities. But Russia, everyone is given an opportunity. So I see that as something that's a unique. So it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, the certificate is overly acceptable. So you graduate from any university in Russia and do well, you can do well to work or to get to the or do things to the time you this is. So why should you start Russia? Why Russia? Why not? What's the big about Russia that should make you to be interested? It's a number six country to study tech courses. It comes after Germany, uh, USA, China, South Korea, and Japan. Japan is number one nation as far as tech is concerned. So uh, Russia is also up there. You can study in English, you can study in Russian language, or, or you can choose to study in both 
down wages. So those options are there. Most international students actually get full-time jobs during their last semesters, according to uh, statistics available. And you can access uh, several European and Asian countries easily. Like I said, it's bordered by about 16 countries. And then other uh, peculiarities, as far as uh, international student uh, admission goes, but there is one intake per year for international students who are going in for regular courses. I mean, you're starting a bachelor's program or a master's program, but if you are going in for language study, you have options of about three intakes. So you can choose uh, September, December, or January intake. And I also mentioned that there are a lot of, uh, all the, the universities in Russia uh, boast of a lot of industry collaboration. So it's a good opportunity for you to actually get such uh, links. So uh, most of the schools have that, they offer you that. And then I also mentioned that even as a full-time student, it's a lot easy for you, especially if you are a postgraduate student, it's easy to take on full-time employment as well because of the way the uh, lecture times are structured. And the application process, I said, that is, uh, if you are working with us, then we do credential evaluation free for you, check your uh, documents to be sure that, okay, this is what you'll be qualified for, this is what you can do. We also provide free advice to all our students on uh, maybe courses to take or advise you on options that you may you should consider based on your background. And then uh, document legalization, that's the question somebody was asking and I said, uh, maybe I'm going to reserve that until later because there could be other questions that will come with that. And then uh, application for courses, doc, uh, for courses and scholarship will follow that. You will not be able to make applications for courses or scholarship without your document uh, legalized and translated at the uh, Ministry of Education and Ministry of Foreign Affairs in your country. Then you can apply for language study as well after that uh, legalization and translation. And then tuition and living expenses, city dependent and also cost dependent, depending on where you're studying. If you're at the capital city, you'll be prepared for uh, a lot, uh, a much higher, um, living expenses than when you study in a place that is far from the uh, capital cities or the big cities. Uh, On-campus accommodation is relatively cheap and your scholarship, you can have full scholarship or uh, partial scholarship, which is like um, maybe a percentage of waiver of your tuition fees. Uh, visa processing, I said it's very simple, very straightforward. You get an invitation letter from your institution, you make an online application, you get an appointment with the Russian embassy in your country, and then you go for interview, and that's it. You're ready to leave for Russia. Of course, people get rejected, so uh, there could be a number of reasons that could make people to get rejected. So that's one of the things we take care of with uh, our students. Application to offer letter usually can happen within one or three weeks. If it stays longer than that, there could probably be some peculiar problem with the student. But if you have legalized your documents and you have translated them, then within three weeks, you get your offer letter. Uh, average tuition in the universities away from the capital cities, I said it's about $2,500 while uh, average monthly living expenses can go as low as $200. But if you stay in the capital city, then you will be ready to pay a little bit more than that, or maybe much more than that. So I think uh, basically those are the uh, major things that I think uh, I want to touch. Okay, on. so I'm just going to run through a few uh, FAQs and then talk about other things. So these are a few of the questions that have been asked over and over again. Uh, in webinars like this. Can I bring my family if I want to study in Russia? Will my spouse be able to work? For now, Russia does not have an answer for this, which what it means is that uh, you will have to go first and see how it works. Because unlike most uh, universities 
that we deal with. Uh, many of them, what they do is, you know, as a student, when you resume uh, and then you register, you get your student pass or student visa, then you can invite your family and your family can just come over and stay with you. In some countries, your spouse can work. In some countries, your spouse cannot work. So our policies differ from country to country. So for Russia, uh, they, they want to, the universities only want to deal with the students. They don't want to deal with families. So I think that would be a question that uh, individual universities will, will have to address. Uh, how much do I need to pay to begin my studies? It depends on your universities. And many of them have flexible payment options because I think I've seen that question from someone. Many of them have uh, very uh, flexible options. So what they do is their an account is open for you and that's a student account. And then you start, you can pay your tuition as it comes. You can pay as many times as possible until you finish paying it off. So as long as you pay within the period that you need to uh, make the payment. So, and for how much depends on your university and the course that you're studying. If I work, can I pay my own fees? I would want to say yes and no. Yes, because if you study in a university that is not too expensive, I've spoken with a number of the students and yes, they are paying their own fees. So they work and they pay their own fees. But if you don't have a good job, or if you are studying in a university that is very expensive, then you may need maybe a little support to be able to pay your own fees. Or if you are, yeah, if so, if you work, you can pay your own fees if your university is not too expensive. Uh, what kind of job can I do? That would depend on what skills you have. Usually, students uh, will go for uh, many jobs and some small, small jobs like uh, working in restaurants. Um, you can do some online jobs as well. So it depends. And a lot of times also, depending on the collaborations that the universities have, they get uh, offers from the industry. So the industry approaches them and then they could you know, take on their students to do uh, part-time jobs in the industry. So it depends on what you're able to find, but uh, according to them, uh, a number of opportunities are available during the summer. So we have, uh, actually we have a page on our website that is dedicated to uh, studying in Russia. You can read a lot more about uh, uh, what you can do, how you can prepare for working in Russia. So I'm already in my third year of university in my country. Can I transfer my studies to Russia? Definitely you can do that. So, but then you have to apply fresh like a new student. And then when your offer goes through, then you can now do the uh, transfer of studies. Then they are going to evaluate what courses you have done and then what uh, opportunities you can be provided with. So what, well, how many years you can skip, how many semesters you can skip, that will be sorted out. So you are not going to lose all your years of study. You may lose maybe a semester or two, depending on, I think your results also is going to matter here. So if you are a good student, definitely you have a good opportunity. But if you are not a good student, that may mean something too. If I don't pass the scholarship test, can I take it again next year? That will be the next, uh, the next uh, session. So if you take it for this, se this session, you can't repeat it because uh, I mean, that won't be fair to others. So what's the implication of not passing the scholarship test? Actually, if you don't pass the scholarship test, you can still study in Russia. What it only means is you're not going to get a full scholarship and you may not get a uh, partial scholarship. But if you pass the test, it could be that you're getting a full scholarship and if you don't pass well, maybe depending on the percentage, because what they do is they have uh, a number of percentage of waivers depending on your score in the scholarship test. So if you pass well, then your waiver will be high. And if you, pass, if you don't pass well, you may have very low waiver. It usually ranges between 10 and 80% for the partial scholarship. So you can get as much as 80% waiver and you may get 0% waiver if you don't pass well. So the implication of not passing the scholarship test is 
you may not get any waiver on your tuition fees. Uh, what opportunities are there for PR or citizenship for international students? Well, I think uh, Russia has a policy that if you live in the country for five years at a stretch and you don't stay outside Russia for more than three months at, a, at any uh, point in time, then after five years, you are free to apply for a permanent residency in, in uh, Russia. Okay, so if your questions are not addressed there, save them for the Q&A session, and then you can also ask in the WhatsApp uh, group. So I mentioned something about language study earlier. There are three intakes, September, December, January. If you have your documents legalized, you can still meet up with the December application now. But if you, if you don't, then you have to wait for the January um, admission. It's usually one year or six months intensive. So if you register for the language study for September, then you're going to have a one year program. But if you register in December or in January, then you're going to do the six month intensive program, which will be January to June in preparation for you to resume your normal study by September of the uh, next year or of that year. So then just to answer the question, if you finish your language study in June, and you're starting, starting your program in September, then what happens between June and September? That's what I mean by the gap filler, that's your post-language post study. That means the, the university is going to extend your visa and give you a new contract to start your full program in September. So what that means for you is those three months will be a good time for you to work and make some money before you start your program in September. I think that's a good one for you. Why? Should you do language study? Well, it enhances your employment opportunities. Russia uses Russian language in their social settings. So if, especially if you stay far away from the capital cities, it will give you an opportunity to work much more easily than, those, than if you don't speak the language. So language study will deliver a lot more opportunities. Apart from that, there are scholarships that are only reserved for those who are studying in Russian language. So you stand a lot more, better opportunities for uh, scholarship if you study using the language. And, uh, but then you can also study the language without necessarily uh, studying in Russian language. So it only enhances your opportunity. And if you are thinking about staying back, of course, uh, it will help you. And who should do language study? I'll say anyone who is planning to study in Russia, it's a good one for you. Even if you're studying in English, still take time to do uh, some language study. You can even do the study before you go. You can know there are a lot of applications out there that you can actually learn uh, Russian language on. So at least pick up some things that can help you get through term, get through communi basic communication. Uh, that will be a lot of help for you when uh, the time and uh, scholarship is open to everyone. So everyone can apply unlike other places where you have to be a top student to apply in, in Russia. You can apply irrespective of your background. Scholarship test, is, it has to be taken by everyone. And like I said, it doesn't matter whether you don't pass well, you still have to take the scholarship test. And then right now the scholarship uh, application for full and partial scholarship is on against uh, September 2022. So you can apply before December 10th. Application closes by 10th of December. It's, uh, it takes some process. So if you are interested in that, we can help to put you through uh, the process to apply. But it has to be done the latest by 10th of December. Uh, that would be like uh, less than a month to now. Uh, our processing charges generally, uh, I think uh, this should capture everything because now I've added not only Russia, because we do uh, admission to practically everywhere you want to go. So the credential evaluation is always free for any student that approaches us. We check and we let you know you can go in here, or you can't go in here. We do that for you free. Appli uh, admission and scholarship application usually is $150. 
if you are applying to Russia or any public uh, universities in Malaysia that we are covering. The rest of Europe, Canada, USA, and Australia is $500. And that covers your application fee as well. And usually we make application to at least two universities for you. And then uh, for research scholars, you, uh, your fee, your processing fee is $500 plus any application cost that you are going to have to pay. So if you want to apply to three, four, five universities, we can support you to do that, but you're going to pay the application cost to those uh, universities. And so we are offering this bonus for anyone who is in this webinar today, instead of $150, if you are applying to Russia, whether for scholarship or not for scholarship, we are going to, uh, we're giving a waiver of $50 of that. So you can pay uh, $100 for that application if you apply before December 10 or by December 10. So, and I think uh, these are uh, our links. And I put a notice there, if you are coming from PBB, always remember to let us know that you are from PBB. Just indicate PBB in your application, your emails, in your form, or in any communication with us. So I think uh, I'm done with the presentation. Usually it's based on uh, performance during the interview. If we are unable to convince the interviewers that you are actually going to Russia to study. So that's because I think I will say Russia uh, visa processing is one of the easiest, yeah, one of the easiest so far in most of the countries that we cover. But then if you go for interview and they're asking you what's the name of your university, which uh, city are you going to study and all those kind of things and you are unable to answer confidently, usually uh, because we have, uh, we got some feedback recently from some of the universities we are covering where a number of African students were not offered scholarship. And so another reason is when the, uh, when your offer is making it look like you are not really being serious about studying. For example, many of those that were, that their visa applications were rejected were those who were going for um, language study, who could not convince them the reason why they needed to go for language study. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's usually um, the major reason that we saw for Russia. For most other countries, it's um, usually on the basis of uh, funds. If you don't show uh, a strong proof of funds, yes, they may not uh, give you this. But uh, Russia doesn't really place uh, too much emphasis on uh, proof of funds, but it will be good for you to be able to convince them that even if they are not asking you to bring uh, maybe three months or six months uh, bank statement yet, you should be able to say where your source of funding will be coming from, and it should be something that will be believable. So if, for example, you are saying, oh, my dad is a primary school teacher, and my mom is a uh, petty trader, and then you are going to study in a university where you have to pay like uh, $5,000. So who is going to pay? How are you going to pay? How are you going to be able to afford the cost? and you are not able to provide any convincing evidence of that, then usually it's, it could be a no. The, doc, the sponsor doesn't really have a specific role other than being your sponsor. And uh, like I said, it's usually during the visa processing time that you have that issue coming up like, they ask you who is sponsoring you, what does the person do and how, um, so the whole idea is how is this person going to get the money to be able to sponsor you? They want you to give some convincing uh, evidence of that. So that's where the uh, sponsor issue comes in. But like I said, unlike other countries, Russia doesn't really ask for uh, bring uh, uh, 
uh, bank statements and all that they, they don't. It has from any one of the students that we process that nation for. But, and in some places they don't even ask them, like all the ones that went from Malaysia, there was no interview. They just submitted their documents and they asked them, okay, come back at so-so date. And they went back and they got their visa. But for those we processed from Nigeria, for example, they asked them, they asked some, some of them, they passed without any interview. They just asked them to submit their documentations and come back for their visa. But for a few of them whose uh, applications looks you know, a bit uh, weird, they asked them to come for interviews. And so they wanted them to convince them that they're actually going to Russia to study. Like we had the case, and I think that's one of the things that I wanted to also address because people do ask that question. What if I have an HND? Russia has no room for HND as a degree. So if you have an HND, the only thing they will tell you is apply for bachelor's. You can't apply for master's degree. So we had a student who had that issue. He already had an HND and then he, he wanted to apply thinking he could get a master's degree, but the university said, no, Russia doesn't have that room. You have to apply for a bachelor's program. So he applied for a bachelor's program. And when he submitted his documents for visa, the embassy felt like, you already have a master, I mean, a, a, an HND. Why are you going for a bachelor's degree? So he was invited for interview. And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to speak convincingly about why he needed to go to study for a bachelor's degree. So he was denied a visa, but we stepped in and we, are, we spoke to the university and the university is interfacing with the embassy now and trying to, they, so they are, uh, they have already requested for another invitation for him so he can go back for uh, scholarship interview. So now he knows what to expect and he can prepare better. So we are uh, hoping he is going to be able to get that. So if you have an HND, you are going to do another degree. That's the idea. You are going to apply for degree, the bachelor's program, full bachelor's program. Maybe after you get there, you can take your chances and talk to your faculty, uh, speak to records and see if there's anything that can be done for you in terms of waiver. But seriously, I don't think it's going to be worth it. So you wouldn't want to bother yourself about it. So just take it that if you have an HND or a diploma, whatever, anything diploma, you're going to be applying for a bachelor's degree. Going to study. What have you been doing for the past 10 years? Now you want to go to, because if someone uh, finished an HND uh, like uh, 10 years ago, I would want to put it like at least the pe this person is going to be about 22 years at the time he finished HND. 10 years later, it will be 32. So at 32, you are applying for a bachelor's program. Uh, it's a bit questionable. And so you are going to have to do a good work of convincing the embassy official about your uh, intention. So if you are able to speak convincingly, tell them what has happened and why you needed to do this at this time, I think you can, you can get through. You just need to speak confidently and you know, be sure that truly that's what you are going for. So it's okay to you know, tell them, uh, this is what I've been doing the past 10 years, but I've been having this issue with my qualification and I feel like no time is too late for me to you know, improve on my, make, take a better step for my career or improve my qualification. And that's the reason why I'm doing this. And I can afford to take care of this by myself because I've worked for these past 10 years, I've saved up, or I have this person who is going to help me in this way and in this way. So uh, you just need to do a good work of, of convincing the uh, embassy official. maximum three weeks 
usually within three weeks you hear from your institution. Sometimes it's much shorter than that, but let's just put it at three weeks, you should be able to get a feedback. I think one of the things that uh, we have noticed in our experience dealing with Russia is the work ethic over there. Compared with other countries that we deal with, the rate of, um, the response rate, it's quite impressive. It's very impressive. You send in a mail in the morning, in the next two, three hours, you get a response. So it's, uh, it's impressive. So it's no, they don't delay wasting precious time on things that are not necessary. The legalization and translation is oh, in cases. Your, so depending on what you are applying for, your last your last certificate and transcript is what you need to translate and legalize. So for example, if you are applying for a master's degree, then you only need to legalize or translate your bachelor's degree. You don't need to do it for your uh, high school uh, certificate. If you are applying for a PhD, you only need to do that for your master's degree certificate and transcript. And if you are applying for a bachelor's program, you need to do for your high school uh, certificate. So what you do is the, at the first stage, you go to the Ministry of Education in your country. There will be an office there. Usually, if you check on the website of the, your uh, ministry, you will be able to find which office handles uh, legalization of documents. So you can just walk in there and then you ask them, I mean, present your document for legalization. Depending on the country, uh, you may have to do that by yourself. If you want to ask someone to do that for you, you probably need to give a power of attorney to that person to be able to do it on your behalf. So you do that at the Ministry of Education, then you go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you do the same. And after that, you go to the Russian embassy in your country. If there is no Russian embassy in your country, then it's going to have to be maybe the, the country nearest to you where the Russian embassy is uh, located. So that's uh, the process. And when you go there, you, also, you will need to do both translation and legalization. So the process usually is you legalize first, then you translate. So some of them offer services for translation, some of them contract it out. But our experience with that is uh, they make some good business out of it, which doesn't really make too much sense for us. So what we do for our students is after the legalization, we handle the translation for them. So we send the document to the university because we have a relationship with the university. So we send it, their documents to the university for translation by the university expert. So they pay the cost of translation directly to the university through their student account. That's what we do for them. And by our experience, what they've paid is like a quarter or a third of what the embassy wanted to take from them. So uh, that's uh, our experience with that. So that's the legalization and translation process. But you can also do that with them. You can do everything at the Russian embassy. That is a legal issue. I'm not a lawyer, but I will say you can try. Usually, uh, name issue is uh, it's a big issue. We have had so many cases like that. Right now, we have a case where the admission, everything is wasted. She had paid about 3,000 plus ringgit, and then only to discover that she had two names on the uh, certificate. She had three names on the international passport, and that was it. It was rejected by immigration. So uh, a mistake on the name, you can try. You can try to uh, use a fidafi to correct it. Sometimes it works. It depends on which immigration you are dealing with. So it's, there's no harm in trying. That's, that's what I would say. Then if it is from the onset, you have already you know, attached it to the certificate, it will work. We have had cases where we have done that for people and it worked. 
And we have also had cases where the embassy, I mean, the immigration said no. So that's why I said there's no harm in trying. It could work. And apply online direct. So this is our Russia page. If you are able to see my screen, I'm just going to scroll a little down. So why you should study in Russia is there. So someone was asking the other time about uh, work visa. According to uh, Russian federal law 2020, it grants uh, all international students permission to work full time if you can afford the time. A work permit is not required by students to work. And you can live in Russia after graduation. Like uh, tuition fee is very low, like I've mentioned before. And then uh, there are also additional benefits that we have with some of our partner universities that if there you can read up, uh, you can read up 